Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! No! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shook Liston, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? I am rested and rejuvenated, and I am ready to do things. Excellent. What I don't know of... what those things are, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. I had to share with you. I went used book shopping over the Thanksgiving holiday. Oh, no. And went to one of those places with just stacks of books everywhere. I, I got a Contributions of Women in Sports. That looks like a very small book for Contributions of Women in Sports. Well, it's it was a library book from 75, but it has Babe Dictrickson, Saharius, Kathy Kusner, an Olympic equestrian, Wilma Rudolph, Billie Jean King, Peggy Fleming, and Melissa Belote who is a backstroker and huh. then there's another outstanding women section but i think it's made for kids also got peggy fleming the long program oh i remember that book did you read it no okay this may show up on your doorstep at some point when i'm done with it <laughs> i remember when she did the book tour and i think she was on donahue that's how old that book is <laughs> oh yeah how old is this book Copyright 1999. Wow. This is going to be a gem. And then I got the exclusive ABC's TV sports guidebook to Mexico 1968. Oh, that's a fine. Yeah, this was this was a fine. So it it is pictures and previews of all of the the sports kind of thing. So I'm looking forward to per perusing that at some point soon. So that's exciting. that's some nice cold weather reading you got there. Exactly, exactly. But speaking of old stuff, we are going into the archives today w with uh, Atlanta 1996, and it's a shame we couldn't travel there when we had our Atlanta year. But in th this past month, I had the opportunity to go to Atlanta, so I contacted the Atlanta History Center, and they were kind enough to give me a behind-the-scenes look at the Atlanta 1996 archives. I talked with collections manager Erica Haig, who showed me a few of the thousands of things they have in storage. The Atlanta Centennial G Olympic Games Commission loaned all of their materials to the museum in the late 1990s, and then in 2002, deeded all of that material to the museum. And as you may remember, these games were known for being very commercialized. So it may not come as a surprise that the museum is still processing items from this collection. So Erica showed me a few highlights and also walked me through Shuklastani Sarah Dill's exhibit on the Atlanta 1996 games. Take a listen to our conversation. The Atlanta Olympics are really interesting, which you probably know, because mm -hmm. they were sort of bridging that gap between technology. It was the first yeah. games that had a website. And then we also have, and I have something really cool to show you. I think it's really cool. My mom worked in the TV industry, and so it was also one of the first ones that had an actual satellite plan and like a plan for how all of the trucks were going to work in conjunction to make sure that everything was filmed and like shot live and broadcast and like also arranging with all of the international news companies. So I think locally in the U.S., NBC bought rights for it for like 48, 485 million, I think it's million. Uh, it was a lot of money, but internationally there was other trucks that had to come in or other vehicles that had to come in with their satellite information. So we have one of those plans that were donated to us to show like how everything was organized. And yeah, I, I got some of our schlocky things out. I also am a big fan of Izzy. So this is actually the Izzy prototype doll out here. And then something that we didn't have a lot of Paralympic things, but something that we do have is actually from a Canadian athlete, I'm like Walter Wu. He is a swimmer. Okay. And he actually works for Home Depot. And like oh, wow. Atlanta is the headquarters for Home Depot. And so we have this really unique connection there and we actually have some swim goggles here and i think his swim cap is actually out on display but we have izzy out and this is the prototype of izzy so he's not like exactly the izzy that we all know how early of a prototype is this 
It's probably still from like the early 90s. And we have a really fun display of this upstairs of how Izzy was sort of sprung from the mind of Billy Payne as a creature, right? And here there's like this cartoon that sort of shares how that progressed. So we get Izzy. We still have the rings on his tails. But he doesn't have his lightning bolt eyebrows yet, and he also has slightly different portions, but still pretty familiar as Izzy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we have we got him, and let me show you. I can bring out one of the ones that was like actually. Who has Barbies? Oh my gosh, yeah. a Swatch watch! Mm -hmm. Holy cow! So like, what didn't fit in the exhibit? The exhibit has probably maybe a hundred items in it. Uh huh. And we have over five thousand. Wow. Um, oh, hey. Materials. So it's the little Hummer mascots. Coke like bottles. Have all of our Izzy dolls here. So this is the first What's It? And it's signed by Billy Payne. And so he's got his eyebrows here, right? The zigzag. And he looks pretty similar to the prototype, right? The dimensions are just a little bit different. His legs are a little bit shorter. He's still got the rings. He's still got yeah. the cool sneakers. So all of those things still exist. But that's the difference. But there's a... A lot of really funny photos of the first prototype of the mascot costume. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, and you have more up there, yeah, too. Yeah, so Holy Izzy cow. is so very through popular. A lot of, lot of iterations. Well, all of these are actually licensed ones. So all of okay. these are just slightly different licensed brand ones. When we got the materials from the games, a lot of it is really similar, right? There's a lot of similar things that are remade over and over again mm -hmm. or slightly different but that's because they're selling all of these materials right everything is licensed everything is available for sale or resale and that's why they have so many different variations of okay. things so you see like thousands and thousands of pins buttons badges however you want to call them pin collecting was super super yep. a 90s thing so we, I, i'm going to show you one of the notebooks that we have of those but everything was licensed through the usoc of course and then because all the brand stuff had to be approved but there's slightly different variations either in size or in like how the Izzy is posed or uh, things like that. So okay. these are all sort of mid-sized Izzy's. <laughs> and then we also have a really large Izzy up in the gallery, which is slightly terrifying to people that don't know it's there, but also as a child of the 80s that was around in the 90s and got to like watch the Olympics and be very excited about it. Izzy was my first mascot, right, that I remember mm -hmm. from the Olympics. And so... I have a connection to Izzy, and I love that Izzy. So every time I see it in the gallery, I just want to hug it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's behind glass, so you don't hug no, it. No, but it, he, he's very endearing to me, and other people don't like him. But no, I think he's I... a cool character. But but that's that's the thing, though. When you're a kid, mm -hmm. if that's your... Like, I'm a Sam the Eagle girl. Same reason. And we have our book club leader, oh, loves Izzy to death. But that's yes. a sweet spot when you get the right mm -hmm. mascot for the right age. Yeah. For the exhibit, it was very interesting because we wanted to make sure that for a lot of kids, especially mascots are something that they can identify with and mm -hmm. they can like connect with. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that we held on to that whimsy. <laughs> and so we actually put several different mascots into the timeline. So leading up into where you go into the exhibit, you get to experience the different mascots over time. Not all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. We did select a few that were our favorites. So we have like Amic the beaver from Montreal. Yeah. He's there. And then we've, we've got some of the ones from the games after the Atlantic games, of course. So uh, you get ones from like the London games, which are also... They're made up strange. sort of creatures, yes. yes. So all of that's a lot, lot of fun, and it was fun uh, learning more about the different mascots. But Izzy is one of my faves, for sure. So a lot of the materials over here near the Izzy's are things that were given by different groups or by different na nations to the Centennial Olympic Games Commission. And then we also have like Izzy Pain Brick, right? The bricks are something that was a huge fundraising effort for the games. And if you go down to Olympic Centennial Park today, even you can see all of the bricks. So it's, it's weird to catalog bricks sometimes, right? And be like, this is an artifact, but it is. <laughs> It is an artifact and it is something that was a huge part of the games. So when you're looking through some of their, their papers and their documentations, all of the, the bricks are a big part of how they fundraised for the games. So, And sports equipment. Yes. Uh -huh. New beach volleyball, first game. Yes. Uh -huh. So we have like the badminton rackets here. And some of this is items that were used in the games. And then sometimes it's also branded material that was sold in advance of the games. 
for people to enjoy and like get excited about it, right? I think my favorite thing in the collection, and I don't know if this is actually on exhibit or not, I didn't check to see, is a, a car club uh, or car stick that you'd put into your a steering wheel as like a security device. Oh yeah, uh, that is uh, Olympic uh... branded. <laughs> And it's just kind of like, okay. And then also with that technology too, you could buy a floppy disk that had multiple different backgrounds for your computer screen on the floppy disk that came with a mouse pad. Nice. <laughs> so wow. uh, they were really pushing the tech and I am here for it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of different... Wait, is it five and a half inch floppy or is it it's the a three, three and a quarter? It's three and a quarter. Oh. It's, a, it's not the big, big floppies. No, since we're still like... Late 80s, early 90s, the larger floppy disks did to get phased out. So then we were, we're down to the small size floppies, but we're not yet to like full CD-ROM. Okay. <laughs> so not everyone had the CD-ROM yet. But, but yeah, so all sorts of different materials on this side of the, the shelving. And we can take a look at some of the schlocky things that I pulled yeah. out yeah. here. Izzy was on a lot of things, right? And a lot of different poses too. So one of the cups back here, you can see that he had a pose for nearly every event or a nearly every sporting arena. And so there's a whole set of, I believe, pens that is just him and his different sporting poses. So this is the baseball one and we have all sorts of other ones. This is the, actually the running the baton relay race. And then you've got the javelin here on the... <laughs> So those poses were used in all sorts of materials that you can see, right? Like coffee mugs, glasses. We even got like a little children's dining set here mm -hmm. with like a bowl and spoon and fork. And then like also on like hair ribbons and things like that. So all sorts of different stuff. Is this leftover ribbon from like... Yeah, the so from the medals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the leaf pattern that's on it is the Quilt of Leaves pattern, which mm -hmm. was the design element that was made specifically for the Atlanta Games. And it's supposed to be a quilt because like Southern traditions, quilting, we're all coming together, mm -hmm. pieces, parts coming together to make a whole. And then the leaves are like a heralding back of the laurel leaves. Okay. That's sort of the idea behind it. And so uh, they also gifted quilt makers of Georgia. Actually, this is the book the quilt catalog book for it and there was an effort to actually create quilts for all of the winners i believe or each country at least so they were all gifted different quilts that were made from the quilters of georgia i think that there were more than just georgia quilters as part of that group mm -hmm. but um they were the ones that organized that mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah i can't imagine sewing all of those quilts but and it wasn't just a single quilt design it was each quilter could design whatever they wanted and like it was oh, usually okay. like a quilt of leaves sort of pattern okay. but it was something that they they used and, and did so it's pretty neat so I have to ask, because the Atlanta Games were known as being very commercial. Yes. Does that make an archivist's job more difficult because there is just so much stuff? Yeah, there's so much schlock. I mean, you think about all of the passive cultural things that were branded with the Olympics. And, like, you can see that we have, like, McDonald's boxes, like a Big Mac box, and, like, cups and things like that that were things that would be thrown away, but were still branded with the Olympic Games. And like merchandise like that was, was also similar. So I have to ask about the cups. When does somebody go, oh, we need to save one and pull it out kind of thing? Or... Yeah. So how do I we mean, collect what yeah, we collect? How do you yeah. That's a great question. So for these, none of these were like used, right? Like there are a Monopoly game, World's Cup here is not full of grease stains. Right. Uh, we're not pulling that out of the trash. <laughs> these were actually ones that were collected by the commission. All of these things were collected by the commission and it was all because they were maintaining brand, right? So they were in control of what was being created. And so they kind of had like a, a type collection of all of the materials. So these were new <laughs> these okay. were not yet produced or put out to people but it was them checking off that the torch logo was right that it has this quilt of leaves pattern that you can see on the background over all of like the pontiac and sea world and bush gardens mm -hmm. oh, okay co so co-sponsoring but all of these were brand new materials that okay. were being checked out by the games commission in advance of them actually being put out into production and consumption by individuals now 
some of the things like the Coke cans were actually something that they had been filled at one time <laughs> and they actually had to clean out. So there's notes on all of the different materials depending on how they came to us or how they came to the Games Commission because all okay. of this is the Games Commission. Do you ever get tempted to, because uh, I see that they're, the McDonald's cups have the pull to play, I think. Do you ever get tempted <laughs> to pull or no? You're just like, no, no, I mean, yourself. I don't know that they're going to uh, honor my uh, 1996 <laughs> ticket pool. Uh, I mean, what are they going to do? Send me back in time? Because it, uh, it is a win a trip to the 1996 <laughs> Olympic Games. Uh, Sit in front of a VCR. Here right? you go. No, it's never super tempting. A lot of the stuff that I find more tempting from a standpoint of like finding out more about it or, or wanting to like do something is we, we can't clean all of the stuff right because some of these things if they were used the use is part of the history right so if there's staining or if there's something like that like that's part of the history of that object and that's part of the story that it has and so we want to make sure that that's actually maintained in some ways as long as it's not hazardous to the actual item so we don't have that with any of this stuff but in other collections that is a concern okay. that we have so Generally, uh, for the large part of our, our collections are things that are donated by people from around Atlanta, around the U.S., around the world sometimes. And they contact us and they say, I have this thing that is related to the history of Atlanta. Do you want it? And we have a whole committee process. It's not just me saying yes or no. It goes to a committee that meets once a month and we assess that and see if it meets our collecting plan. So we have a full plan of what we want to collect, why we want to collect those things and how it's going to fit into our long term mission. Because once it is part of our collection, it's here for the long haul. Right. We see ourselves as stewards of Atlanta's history. And that's Atlanta's history given to us by the people, for the people, right? Uh, we hope that we're holding these things in trust with them and helping preserve them for the long term for people to continue to learn from them for years to come. So that's why we have all of this. <laughs> Even if it does seem a little schlocky sometimes. <laughs> Izzy is staring at me between the <laughs> the coffee mug. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just open up like a drawer, <laughs> and it's like Izzy here is rollerblading, and this is one of the magnets, right? So rollerblading Izzy, we got torch bearing Izzy, all sorts wow. of stuff. Izzy does everything. Izzy does everything. So here's our big mat box. So <laughs> very. <laughs> iconic question mark but yeah they branded literally everything so it it does pose a question of how much do you keep and what do you not hold on to but since a large part of this game was the commercial aspect of it that's something that we try to keep in mind i also pulled some things out here the pins again i was born in the 80s as a child that was growing up in the 90s pin collecting was a big deal mm -hmm. and you could go and you could do pin swaps and like that is where like birthday money, Christmas money, and like got saved up to buy like certain types of pens or if you went somewhere, like that would be your souvenir item, right? So the Olympic games were no different <laughs> in that aspect for a lot of kids. I did not have the ability to go since I was growing up in Ohio, but these are some of the pens that were being sort of forwarded on to get approved for production. Okay. And this isn't just for the games, this is also for the build up to the games, right? So we've got pens in the collection that are like so many hundreds of days out or a thousand days out from the Olympics, which is like three years, right? <laughs> People were real excited. So we have got a whole binder of these here. And then we also have a scrapbook that someone made. Uh, and this is multiple days worth of the Olympics. And we actually have one of these in the exhibit. But I found it really interesting that they actually had a article on how the pens are made because they have a pen fever primer. Wow. <laughs> for the Olympics. There's a lot of personal history of mine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's uh, okay. So all of these binders have the different numbers. These are the different numbers of the pens, but they were also used to identify like what the submission was for the Atlanta game. So this is all one brand that made these designs and then was submitting them in to have approval for them. So you see like some of them were denied, but then we also have others that were approved. So we have like Shamrock Izzy. <laughs> Things, question mark. And then here's a 500 day one, a 400 day one, getting ready. Here's an I love Izzy one at the bottom. I mean, who doesn't? And all sorts of ones. So different Izzy designs. 
all sorts of stuff. So here's what I was talking about before. Like we've got the baseball Izzy again. We have swimming Izzy, gymnastics Izzy, rowing Izzy, Izzy doing everything. So all of these are again from the same producer. I think this entire binder is. So there's a pen literally for anyone and everything. There's like these charm ones that have different charms in the middle for the different events for the different countries. There was easy uniting the world ones and things like that, that this was the first Olympics where all of the it's like 192, four, six, six, I think it's an even number. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. but all of them were actually represented in these Olympic games. Okay. And that was the first time that that, that had happened, I believe. So uh, there's a lot of like these uniting the world or like unification or representation of all of the countries in a variety of ways. And pins were, were in with that. So we got a Christmas pen, got to get in the holiday spirit, all sorts of stuff. And we have binders and binders and binders of these pens. In addition to the pens that were produced and then actually like left on backers are given uh, separately. So this is something that I thought was pretty interesting, just as like a schlocky bit, right? Like you think of, you think of like pens are being produced, but when you think about the amount of pins. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I mean, this There's is a what, lot of like metal. a... a four inch it's, five inch binder yeah it's like a four inch binder and we have at least a dozen of them and that's not even inclusive of all of the pens that were produced so it's a lot <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot something else i wanted to show you in this scrapbook though is about carrie strug again i was a gymnastics kid as a child and like watching the gymnastics team was a huge deal we had dominic dawes this year and we also had carrie strug and at the time, like as a kid, I didn't really like, I saw that she was injured and like, I didn't really know the impact of it. But then they have like newspaper articles here about how her accident, like how big of it was that she like went and did all this stuff after that. How about these, these goggles? Articles. Yeah. So the Atlanta Olympics were the first time that Wu, I can actually hold you here, was, was in the right Paralympics. There. And these are the goggles that he used in that. And then we have the swim cap that's actually on display. He is a, I think it's an S13, which is a level of visually impaired. Oh, okay. And he actually set uh, records in this Olympics. He won six gold uh, medals and then one bronze oh, wow. uh, for Canada. Okay. And then he went on to participate in two other Olympics, I believe, uh, after this one. But this was the first time that he participated in the Paralympics. And some of his stuff is upstairs okay. in the case. We also have a couple other Paralympians, materials that they used during the Olympics that were either branded Paralympic in some way or helped them with doing what they did during the game. So we can take a look at those okay. in a second. Is there anything else that you want to check out down here that you saw through the shelves and you're like, I want more of it? Uh, open I would be here door. all day. I, yeah, honestly, over everything. Over 5,000 things. Yeah, so. honestly. There's a lot. It's just so fascinating just how much stuff gets produced for an yes. Olympics. And especially mm -hmm. this one, you're like, they did that? They yes. did that? Uh -huh. And it's just, it is mind boggling. It's a lot, a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it's, and like, this is just the material culture, right? So like, when you think about the archival side of things and like how many boxes of materials that there were, and that's only what was kept because there's all these duplicate copies because it's not just the actual Olympic games, but it's all of the buildup to mm -hmm. the games from 87 when Billy Payne started the motion to like, or no, 84, I guess, when he started oh, yeah. thinking about the games and wanting to like prepare for them and like have Atlanta have a bid all the way through the bid process and all the way through to like the actual events and then the cleanup of the events. And it's not just the Atlanta Centennial Olympic Games Commission, but it's also the city of Atlanta and the different institutions here that were involved in the process. So it was a big deal. <laughs> and I don't know if you talked to Sarah at all about this, but when we were thinking about this exhibit, we went from our old exhibit that went through like day by day of the games. And we really wanted it to be different than what we had had up in the past. And what we felt like was really important takeaway is that looking back at the Olympics, how it was a city building event and then like how that changed Atlanta because so many things got built up or torn down because of this. And so there was a lot of positives. There's a lot of negatives. Mm -hmm. So that's just part of the story of the games. And like, you really felt like it was important to share all of that. How much do people talk about the games today around here? I mean, you work with the stuff, so you're thinking about it yeah. more, but like, really, does it come across or... And people go to Olympic Park, so they're just, that's just a place to hang out now and go to events. Yeah. But does it kind of click 
I think that like we get a lot of researchers in, maybe not like a lot, a lot. We get mm -hmm. a we get a few re researchers in that are looking at specific places or spaces that were Olympic related, but we don't get a lot of people coming in to look at like the day to day of the games or of long term legacy of the sporting events of this, this itself. It is very much looking at uh, how the games impacted our day to day lives in Atlanta in the creation of certain thoroughfares and uh, part, things like that. So that's more what, what we see at least uh, of people coming in and doing research in the okay. Game Research Center. The collections are open to researchers by appointment. So we don't have many people that come in and do research into all the schlocky bits, <laughs> uh, but it is something that's a possibility. So if someone out there is interested in researching uh, 1990s mass produced goods, <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of stuff that they can look at. But by and large, most of the people that are looking for Olympic material and come to us are looking for manuscript or visual arts material, which we do have a plethora of. <laughs> so this is the map of the NBC broadcast transmission signal flow plan, right? So when uh, you look at the games from a technology standpoint, they were building all of this infrastructure for broadcast technology and making sure that everything was going to be in people's homes via television everywhere as much as they could. So they have a plan for how things are going to be routed, how it's going to be set up physically, and then how that's going to be beamed across to even like different satellites, right, to be relayed over across the world. So when the donor brought this in, I was really excited by it. And everyone else was like, I don't understand this. But my mom working in television taught me a lot about the importance of broadcast trucks and broadcast crews, especially in the 1990s, because this is how you got that dispatch out, right? Is that you had a physical person out there with their camera and it wasn't like live on Instagram <laughs> or live on Facebook. It was live on the TV via these satellite trucks. So this was how everything got connected. And this is one of the first things that I've seen technology-wise for the games when you're planning for this, was this, this map. Uh, well, and it's plan. just, you know, it's so fascinating to see the Whitewater was way up in like Tennessee mm. and all these venues that are kind of yes. way out. Yes. And they have to plan to, to get all how this it's information all be here. Routed, right? And even though we talk about the games being like in Atlanta, there were so many different stadiums that were everywhere across the board, right? So they did have to really plan to about what they were going, who they're going to send where and what they're going to send where and how it was going to connect and how it was going to be broadcast. So this is the plan for all of that, <laughs> which is pretty neat. And then one of the things that we also have here is part of the manuscript collection. So this is one of the... Braves Panasonic equipment. So Panasonic was the one that actually, the company that helped build the infrastructure. And so there's this whole plan here that was discussed and it has all sorts of the agreements and things like that uh, with drawings and specifications. So it'll have like all of the press stuff in the service information, but it has all of the agreements between Panasonic and what they're going to provide and how it was gonna get fitted out. So about different different areas. So this sort of built into this and then other materials that we have that sort of show how that was all connected. On the back end that no one ever saw except for yeah, the folks that were yeah. doing, doing the actual broadcast and transmission part. Right. So. And it's so interesting because all this stuff is really still in paper. Yes. And uh -huh. in a way, I mean, that's tough because you need physical storage, but in, a, in another way, it's kind of easier to flip through versus digital archiving. Yes. It's, it's its own beast. Yes. So even though these were things that were, were probably created in like early Word documents, <laughs> <laughs> those weren't ever backed up or saved necessarily, right? So the digital history and the digital file might be lost, but we do still have the paper copies. Uh, and sometimes these are actually more valuable as a resource from an archival standpoint because... They sometimes have notations or because they're used copies usually. Mm -hmm. So someone has had it in their hands and they might have jotted notes down that were otherwise maybe lost because it was a conversation and that conversation wasn't recorded. So this is what we have of that. So that's just a little bit of the archival stuff that we have. We also have tons of slides and photos. 
Sometimes they are, while we have access to the physical copy, there's still licensing rights held by either the Centennial Olympic Games Commission or not the commission itself, but mm -hmm. I guess the, the national level or the photographer themselves. So okay. depending on how they were licensed and how they gotten to us, depended on the rights. We also have some of the VHS copies of different events of the games. And so some of those you can actually see in the exhibit. So we can go up there next okay. and sort of see everything. Well, the History Center had a huge sort of role itself in sort of the lead up to the games. This building actually opened originally in 1992, 1993. And we actually displayed all of those quilts that were going to be given to the different, different folks here in this building. <laughs> so uh, there's lots of photos of that event. And that's where that quilt book sort of okay. applies. So uh, earlier when I was talking about the timeline, this is the timeline that is outside the exhibit. So we felt like it was really important to give people context about how the Olympic Games here in Atlanta were being created and how they happened, and then how things continue to happen after that, because the Olympics themselves is an ongoing event. It's not just a one-off. So we have string starting back in the 1890s, and then it goes all the way up to the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, we're actually going to be picking up the Tokyo torch uh, later this month. So oh, nice. that'll be installed soonly. <laughs> but we selected objects for different pieces of time. Sometimes it was a torch, sometimes it was a participation medal. Sometimes it was a, a oh, figure, ah, or a, the beaver, a mascot. So here's Amik, much beloved by all of the exhibition team. Amik is beaver in Blankwe, uh, I think, the uh, native language of the First Peoples. So that is one of our favorites. And then we also have the London mascots where they're down. And I like the London mascots because you have the Olympics and the Paralympic mascots that are pretty similar. Windlock and Land of the Walters when we go backwards exhibit. But this is the, the scrapbook. The same person that made the scrapbook downstairs that I was showing you, this is one of the same ones. So they made a set of three and this is the middle one, I guess. It's okay. day eight. That's one of the yeah. pens. More pens, all pens. <laughs> and then here are some of the materials that I mentioned. So we have Walters swim cap there. And then this prosthesis is also from those games. So Jeffrey McMahon and volleyball. So those are some of the materials that we've got. Uh, and then scattered in here are also items from the Olympic games and not the Paralympics, right? So they were together, but separate kind of, but we put them all in the same case because all of these are sort of items that the athletes used, touched, handled, signed, made sometimes. So it's, it's all materials that sort of speak to the celebration of their athleticness, <laughs> <laughs> their sportsing. <laughs> but yeah, that's where we have who's cap. And then uh, you mentioned the ribbon below. You can see the, the ribbon used on the medals here. And then we have the Paralympic medals below. But all sorts of different stuff up here. I said before that this is the first one that had a website and we have a capture of the website and this is what it looked like right when you scrolled through and we were looking for sound bits of the dial-up sound for internet that was the mm -hmm. you had in the 90s the <laughs> uh -huh. exactly and when we were finding it we, we just kept on laughing because it was like that was childhood sounds for us but yeah this was the website that you would see if you had gone to the website in wait that. so Izzy has an entire family that yeah is are they only in the comics and not I think so wow mm -hmm. so although we did see a Martin pen so okay yeah Izzy has family <laughs> and then this is our this oh my gosh Izzy. So this is the Izzy that was outside of the Welcome Center. And so he's about four feet tall. And only where you can hear the dial-up sound. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets old. So this is the Izzy that was outside the Welcome Center. He's about four feet tall. He's very sort of rigid. He's not like 
He doesn't move or anything. He's not animatronic, but he is very excited. He's got a well, he, smile on I his face. Well, I can see how he He's is like, huggable. Right. Like, you do want yes. to hug him. So there's a lot of photos of that we've gotten of different people that went to the games, and they're hugging Izzy outside the Welcome Center, hugging one of the people that was in the mascot costumes. We have unfortunately not retained any of the mascot costumes themselves because they were so stinky. This is something that people don't talk about a lot, but the games were held in the summer in Atlanta, and if you have not been, it is hot and it is very humid, and being inside a mascot costume would be probably the worst thing that you, like, I cannot imagine that experience, how hot it would be inside. But because there was no way to remove all of the sweat <laughs> from the costume, that was something that was not retained in the early 2000s when these came to us. So this is one of the largest Izzy's that we have in our collection because of that, because we don't have a mascot costume. We did retain some of the shoes because those were separate and those were not necessarily something that was absorbing a lot of the sweat. So we do have a large pair of Izzy shoes. Something that's also sort of technology related is actually this video, which was produced, I believe, by Georgia Tech for the bid process. And it is a oh. fly through of Atlanta as an Olympic city. So I saw something about this where during the bid process at like maybe the final presentation, everyone mm -hmm. was like, whoa, look at the technology. Yes. <laughs> this was like the it thing, right? In in the 90s, you didn't have like Google Maps. You didn't have where you could go through cities. It was very futuristic and it was a big deal. And it was a 3D modeling process that took a lot of computer power when computers were like that size, right? So it's a definitely something that speaks to the technology of the build-up to the games and the games themselves, which is something that we tried to talk about in this exhibit a lot, and we do have a lot of documentation for. And it always blows the younger generation's mind, I think, when they come in here with <laughs> the entire world in their pocket and their, and their phone, and it's like with their smartphone now, they can do literally better than <laughs> what we were able to do in the 90s with an entire department's worth of computing power. But that's technology, right? And it keeps on moving forward. And I think that it's exciting to think about how we were there and now we're, how we are, where are we going, going with that now? So there's one other thing that I was gonna show you and okay. that's over here, it's the kiosk. One of the heaviest objects that we have was this. And it's an information center, right? And this was very futuristic when it went in because you could call on the phone and someone could talk you through purchasing materials or like learning about where you're supposed to go or you could go in and like watch the screen here so there's a whole like how to do it on the on the front but on the back end and underneath it's all computing <laughs> so they have these out at different locations and they're all branded right you've got the torch logo you've got the the quilt of leaves on the side it says Atlanta 96 on it and this was very like oh my goodness and you can see on the side here for ordering tickets and things like that this is actually a call center for the games to have so you can call in and order your tickets <laughs> or order them online kind of so uh, lots of photos like this that are just really pretty fascinating so uh, wow oh, yeah excellent but this was a really fun exhibit to work on. Um, one, because of the nostalgia aspect for me, just growing up and this being my first Olympic Games that I really like absorbed. But we also tried to keep a lot of the 90s feel, vibe, vibe and feel in the exhibit, which, but not in a dated way. <laughs> so we kept a lot of the color schemes that you see throughout the games and our entire color palette was actually pulled from different either materials that the games themselves were using for their materials or like their marketing package or other things like photographs and, and things that were very iconic of the games. So when you come in here, we want you to feel like you are kind of stepping into the 90s and Olympics in, in a good way. Was there anything that surprised you knowing like you experienced the games as a kid, but like yeah. when you look at it as an adult, is there, what, yeah. what surprised you when you pulled this to, when you were working on the? Um, this wasn't necessarily a surprise, but like as a kid, I wasn't here in Atlanta. So right. I didn't get to experience any of the buildup of the games or any of the community issues that were happening. So when they were building out the games, like there were entire neighborhoods that were displaced and there were entire communities that were gone because of this. And sometimes there was conversations with the community about that and then sometimes there was not. And so that's something where that was not surprising to me, knowing like the history of 
the United States as a whole. Uh, and there's a lot of that in our, in our history, but that was something that I learned a lot more about during the process of this. And that's something that we did want to talk about in this exhibit. And I think that we do talk about it to a certain extent, because when you talk about any sort of building of a large stadium or a large project like this, there's a lot of change that happens because of that and not all of it's positive. I think that the games had impact good and bad. I think I said that before, but uh, that's one of the things that's sort of a legacy on both ends. So that's something that we did want to touch on in the exhibit. And there's plenty of different, this area especially, uh, about different things that were going on. So that's something that I learned a lot about. I also learned a lot about the Paralympic Games, which this was the first time that the Paralympic Games were held like in conjunction and planned with the Olympics. So there is a lot of planning of, of both events parallel to each other and not necessarily like pushing one off to the side or having one be, you know, not as important as the other. So lots of things about that, very interesting to learn. So Excellent. I think that was, that was, for me, those were interesting things. I also got to know our collections a lot better. So it, it is interesting to know just how many Izzy things that we have in our collection. When we were ramping up for this exhibit, we were also working on a rebranding project for the museum itself. And so part of that, I was working with photographers, one of which is a really big into shoes and also really big into the Olympics. So he showed him the Izzy shoes and he like lost his mind. He was like, these are amazing. and. Things like that where it's like really bringing joy into different parts of, of history. So, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica. And also thank you to Monique Rojas for arranging everything for us. You geeked out so hard. <laughs> I was not with you. So I listened to, I, I rather read the transcript and listened to your tape. And I could feel your geekiness just oozing off the paper. You were so excited. It was, and, and literally, we went into one rolly shelf, which had about three layers of shelving in it, if I remember correctly. And then the bottom half was drawers. So they had little narrow drawers that you'd pull out and it'd just be pins and flat stuff, all this stuff. And the shelves went pretty far back. I should have taken a picture of how long they did go back. We're going to put a video up of the episode in YouTube, and we'll also have pictures on our website show notes version of this. So check those out if you'd like to see what we talked about. I, honest, Pete, it really was like, is that the metal ribbon? <laughs> what are you doing with a roll of metal ribbon? Right. So the one picture that you sent me was that giant roll of <laughs> metal ribbon. Because you know me so well, you knew that that would be the thing that got me so excited. And I'm thinking, can you imagine wrapping your holiday gifts with that ribbon and presenting it to like super fan Sarah? Oh my gosh. And in the organizing committee did that. Like they had extra ribbon and they just, anytime they had a gift, which probably was often given it was until 1996, they probably used that ribbon as well. I would think, I mean, who wouldn't want to? I'd put that stuff in my hair now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of you for not pocketing anything though. Nicely oh, done. No. <laughs> I do have, I do have some standards. Oh, speaking of who has standards, our wonderful patrons. And it's the time of the year where we give shout outs to our gold medal level patrons. And today we are celebrating Dan Meyer. Dan is a longtime listener of the show and so much fun. And definitely contributes to our Facebook group and messages me on Instagram, which I love. Mm -hmm. And he messages me on Twitter, which I love. So. It's awesome. Dan also has his own Olympics newsletter. So we'll put a link to how to get it in the show notes. And how do people get their own shout out, Jill? There are a ton of ways to support the show. We have one-time options. We have brand new commissions. So you can have your pet be our mascot for a week or you can uh, 
close out the show by telling everyone to keep the flame alive. And there's also ongoing ways you can support the show. Go to flamealivepod.com slash support for more information. And Dan, thank you so much for being a patron and for supporting us financially and keeping our flame alive. We really appreciate you. Uh, that sound means it is time for our history moment. And all year long, we have been talking about Albertville 1992, as it is the 30th anniversary of those games. My turn for a story. We're getting close to the end of the year. I so. know. It's, it's a little time. sad. We're going to have to say goodbye to Albertville again. It's like breaking up twice. <laughs> But what do you got for me today? I got. I promised more biathlon. And so, yes, there's more biathlon today. We are going to the women's side of the competition. 1992 was the first time women competed in the biathlon at the Olympics. And like the men, this, this was nice. The men had three events. The women had three events. The women's events were the same, just shorter. And that happens today still. The women's events are always shorter. But they had a sprint race, an individual race, and a relay. Interesting thing about the relay for the women, it only had three women on a team. Usually there are four and today there are four, but for the first time in the Olympics, they only had three per team. I wonder if it was just to allow more countries to participate because it was be. a relatively new event. So did enough countries have four Olympic well, level well, okay, that they would so want to put in? It, d it depends because the event had been at Eight world champs. It had been in the world championship since 84, dominated by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Shockingly. Union had won all of those world champs. So even though the USSR had dissolved just weeks before the games, the unified team came in as a favorites to win the relay. You can actually watch this race. They have the full race on Olympics.com, a full replay of it. We'll put the link in the show notes. I, I did watch it. And it's the feed with no commentary. Except for every once in a while, you can hear a cameraman telling somebody to get out of the way, which is awesome. And in true 1990 style, almost no graphics. So you don't know what's going on. You don't know who is who. The 1990s fashion made it so hard to tell the countries apart because everybody is wearing some puke explosion of teal and fuchsia and <laughs> purple. And I could not tell any, for the life of me, I couldn't remember whose bib was whose. I mean, I could tell the U.S. Their suit was blue on top with red and white vertical stripes on the bottom and said USA proudly on it as USA is wont to do. But everybody else, and I think even the unified team, the different members of the team had different suits on, which made it worse. Wait, they're not wearing the same thing. And then I thought, well, that must be the unified team because they can't all get the same clothes. They're unified from different parts. I guess so. So race starts off as planned because unified team is gunning to win after shooting the first shooting. They're in first place. But we have a little sign that this race is not going to be as you think it's going to end up because in second place out of shooting the first shooting and we still got a lot of race ahead of us. Second place, a mere 30 seconds behind is China. I'm surprised they were even competing. I know. In they 92. Were, they were sporting a very lovely greenish teal with red violet accent suit. I know. I had the hardest time going. That's China because it wasn't a red suit. It was this, that, that teal, that green, that 19, early 90s green. Anyway, a third place coming out of shooting one was Bulgaria where, sporting purple and fuchsia. And you don't hear about them today at all. I mean, there are still Bulgarian biathletes, but they just, you don't hear about them. And come, and fourth was France, then Italy, and then Germany, who was a favorite to also be on the medal stand here. And they have, who became legendary, Uschi Diesel, who is one of the legends of biathlon in Germany. This is her first games out of like five Olympics that she was in. She ended up missing a target. So this race format was... You get your regular magazine of five bullets to shoot down the five targets. And then you get up to three extra bullets to shoot down anything you missed. And once you've run out of the eight shots, then you have to ski a penalty loop for every missed target. So that's what happened to Ushi. She missed a target and she had to ski a lap. 
other interesting note about how the setup was today you have those three extra rounds in your rifle you carry them with you they had like a pole with little cups attached to it one at standing height and one at prone height and you would grab your extra bullets from this cup cup of bullets (laughs) (laughs) don't confuse it for your water bottle Another bad sign for the unified team, their first first leg skier, Yelena Belova, she took a wrong turn. I am always so surprised because we hear about this often in marathons, in cross-country races. How is that possible? How are there not people standing there guiding them if there's a place where you could take a wrong turn? I never understand this. I'm wondering if there are not enough people. I think there was one person there because I kind of saw, they did a little replay of it, but it's really hard to tell. She just kind of turned around because I think she went towards the finish line section. A a lot of times in biathlon, they had the finish line separate from the way you go into the penalty loop or not the penalty, but they're all kind of connected and there's a few different wrong turns you can make if you don't do it correctly. Clearly a need for more volunteers. And that yes. is that is never a job we talked about during Beijing. But clearly they need more of them. Yeah, but in Beijing, they actually had their loop set up pretty easily. That one made sense to me. There was no real way you could not take the wrong turn out of the shooting range, to be quite honest. So other teams, after Belova takes this wrong turn, other teams start catching up. A Chinese wonderful shooters not that great on skis so they start falling off and now they're a non-threat anymore then the unified team's shooting falls apart yelena belova has to do a penalty loop and their second skier anfisa retsova also has to do a penalty loop so it is not looking good for them germany does stay out of the penalty loop in lake two so they are moving up but who else is showing up france home team France did not have much of a team. As you wondered about the number of biathletes in the women's side, they only had nine certified female biathletes in the entire country, according to NBC Olympics. And one of their best biathletes, Delphine Heyman Burlet, was out sick and could not do this race, according to Olympedia. So, but they're hanging in there. They're doing really well. They have the home team behind them, too. Like three. Unified team takes back the lead, but after the prone shooting, Francis Anbriand very quickly overtook Yelena Melnikova on the ski course. Germany's Ancha Mazerski is right there. So it's coming down to the last shooting. And this is always what you, you love in biathlon. Who is going to get the last shooting bout done first and get back on that ski course? So it really comes down to Germany versus France, and they both have to go to extra bullets. But France gets out first. Anbriand skis her little heart out. Everyone's exhausted. You can tell everyone is so exhausted. And Germany's closing in. But can Mazursky catch, catch Briand? No. Oh. And as Briand is skiing the last section, like the entire coaching staff is skiing down the sidelines, <laughs> yelling her on. That is one nice thing with no commentary. You can also hear the alle, alle. <laughs> She skis the fastest leg of the entire competition by over 45 seconds. Wow. Yeah. Gets gold. Germany took the silver. Unified team takes the bronze. Wow. Welcome to Shook Fliston. It is the time of the show where we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show who make up our citizens of our very own country of Shook Fliston. Quiet week this week. Yes, but this is fantastic. Congratulations to pin collector Don Bigsby, who got married in May. Yay, Don! Table tennis player Millie Tapper did a Movember fundraiser and ran 60 kilometers across five different countries, raising $530 to support men's mental health research. And Kelly Chang and partner Sarah Hughes will be competing this weekend at the Elite 16 Torquay Beach Volleyball Pro Tour event in Torquay, Australia. They won the Australia Challenger last week. (laughs) 
All right. Today, as the show is released, it is December 1st. The ticket lottery sign up starts today, runs through January 31st. So you may see a lot of articles saying that ticket sales have started, but they haven't started. It is signing up for the lottery. I don't know about you, but that has driv- that's already driven me nuts. Well, I can't believe how many Instagram posts, Facebook posts, email messages from all these different organizations about ticket sales start this week. And I just want to look at them and say, liar, you're being inaccurate. It's true. It's very misleading. Signing up for the lottery starts now, goes through the 31st. It's not a first come first serve basis on the ticket lottery. So you have until January 31st to sign up and still have an equal chance to get in when the draw Although you are, if you are not a member of Le Club, you have a less than equal chance because Le Club members get first dibs on all this stuff. But you still have a chance. Paris 2024 organizers have explained how the ticket sales process is going to work. So they're calling it a Make Your Games pack. Clever title. Seats are arranged in five different categories. So there's first category, then A, B, C, D. The highest ticket prices will be 980 euros, which is currently just over a thousand bucks. Yeah, well, you know, the big ticket items are big ticket. Don't worry though, not everything's going to be that expensive. They are selling a million tickets at 24 euros each, and almost half of the tickets for up for grabs will be 50 euros or less. So that's not that's not bad. There's still opportunities. So with this make your games pack ticket lottery event. You register for the lottery. While you wait for the lottery to happen, you look at the website and see what tickets you want to buy. This is kind of the reverse of the process they had before. So you had to go through an authorized ticket reseller. And what they would do is say, hey, sign up for a lottery. Tell us what tickets you want, and we'll do a drawing for all the people who want those tickets. This is the reverse of that. This is a, you tell us you want tickets, and then we'll tell you if you get the opportunity to buy them. And once you do get the opportunity, then you can like pick what you want. Basically, sign up for the lottery if you want to go to Paris. If you're even <laughs> thinking that you may want to go to Paris, just sign up for the lottery because it doesn't cost you anything to sign up. It mm-hmm. doesn't cost you anything when you're chosen. It only costs you when you actually then purchase the tickets. Right. And even if you purchase tickets and you end up not being able to go you can resell your tickets. They'll have a, a ticket resales platform. That's the only place you can resell your tickets and they will have to be sold for face value. So there's no money making opportunity off of this. No bots trying to buy up all the tickets and have a massive secondary market going that will price everybody out. Okay. That's I, only, I only have one problem with this. Mm-hmm. Why is it first ABCD? Oh, I have Why no have they too. mixed numbers and letters? Come on. <sighs> Maybe they didn't know which accent the E would have. (laughs) Okay, that's actually a fair point. (laughs) Yeah, I did wonder that too. I'm like, oh, really? But they kind of gave examples of what your Make Your Gains pack could be like because you can get three sessions. A a pack has three sessions from a range of sports. So for 72 euros, you could get a pack that had athletics, handball, and rugby, gymnastics judo and water polo you could have your pack take place in a whole one city that kind of thing so it sounds like you have some a lot more flexibility i i do wonder if you go oh i want these packs and then you log on with your lottery 48 hour window when you if you do win the lottery you get like 48 hours to buy your tickets how fast the things you want will be sold out Well, that's always the case. You always have to have choices in all the different high value choices like gymnastics and athletics Mm -hmm. and then some less popular choices. So you're saying they use handball and rugby. So be prepared in each column. Right. So you're saying you should have a first choice than an A, B, C, D plan. I would never say that because (laughs) I would keep it consistent. Every, (laughs) Every ticketing account will be able to get a maximum of 10 packs. So you could get up to 30 tickets. No opening or closing ceremonies tickets are being sold in this round. Also, no tickets available for surfing. So I kind of wonder if they're even going to have tickets 
what kind of spectators I'll have for surfing and if it'll just be like, well, this is for the people who live here. The final day for Make Your Games Pack sales will be March 15th. And that's the day that drawings for individual tickets will go up. So this is just, you're going to have to, if you get in this lottery, you're going to have to make a ticket pack and you're going to have to go to get three tickets for three different sessions. Then there's going to be a, I just want one ticket for X. That lottery drawing will start in March and on April 21st. And that sales process will happen in May, 2023. Hopefully it's not complicated. Hopefully it's easier. It actually, if you've ever registered for classes on an online system, it, this feels very familiar. Like you always have to have a couple of classes that you know are going to be no problem to get. And then there's always a couple you're like, oh, those are really popular. They may be gone. I think explaining it is actually harder than doing it if okay. the system works the way it should. Yes. And I hope they're learning from the World Cup. Have you heard the problems with the World Cup tickets on their Crashy, app. crashy. <laughs> Crashes and tickets disappear from your ticket wallet and all of a sudden you can't get into the stadium. That it. Hopefully they are learning from this and will have all those problems troubleshooted because that, that does not sound fun. Uh, hey, guess <laughs> what? <laughs> also fun. Paris 2024 took some flack for the fact that most of their mascots are going to be made in China. And hey, they found more capacity at the factories in France to do more mascots made in France. So now they're they're roughly doing 50% more production there. They were going to do 2,700 Friges a week, and now they're going to be able to make 5,000 a week. And they will also produce 100,000 Friesian caps. So if you wanted the hat itself, skip the beret. If you are if you went to Paris 2024 to buy a Paris 2024 beret, skip that, buy a Friesian cap instead. I wonder if people, it'll depend on the weather, if people will actually wear the caps. Good question. If, it, if Will it become a thing? Good question. Because there's always something that's the thing, whether it's the mittens in the winter or the, like the sunglasses with the rings or the funky sneakers. There's always yes. something. There's always a fashion statement of that games. Right. And remember how we thought it was going to be the umbrella hats for Tokyo? Right. But there, there was nobody there. So there was no fashion statement I for know. Tokyo. So, oh, Paris, you got something to set a trend. I'm excited about that. Okay, the IOC has announced that it's going to have an eSports week in June, from June 22 to 25, 2023. It's going to be a celebration of hybrid physical and simulated sports. The whole thing is going to be like a festival or conference type thing with, with panels and stuff. But they're also going to have the first in-person live finals of the Olympic eSports series. I know you're excited about this. It actually could be interesting. Well, because we've thought of esports as generally being just you sit in a chair and play a video game. And a lot of what this, the games that they play in this series seem to be physically motivated. So you ride a bike, you ride an exercise, basically, through a course that you watch on a screen. Same deal with like a rowing machine, or there, there's different things that, that look like it could be a lot more active than other esports. Not that those don't take stamina, and we know that that esports does take stamina and physical ability, but it's this seems to be a little bit different. It reminds me of the old Wii Sports. Did you ever play yes. that? Yes. Yeah, so that you'd run through the fields and you'd play bowling or you'd play golf or tennis, and those those were very good exercise, especially yeah. when you could not go outside, say in the winter in the Northeast, or it got dark at. 430 like it is now. That was a nice indoor alternative. And the IOC has been pushing very much for how do inner city kids or kids in poorer countries have access to sports and to play and to getting more physically active. And this can be a way, especially when space 
is a real issue and you don't have the facilities to get kids to try some different things. Right. So I'm yeah. actually not upset about this. Right. And the the way that that youth are engaged by video games, this could be something good. And and I'm not going to discount the fact that maybe it's something that you and I could be good at too. I know. I was killer at Wii Bowling. <laughs> they always jumped up and down for me. There will be more details out early next year of how you can get involved. So we will take note. And I'm not saying never say never, Allison. Oh, boy. The International Paralympic Committee has laid down the hammer on Russia and Belarus. They had their extraordinary general assembly and the membership voted to suspend both of those countries. That means they lose all rights and privileges of IPC membership and according with in accordance with the IPC constitution. So basically they can't vote in anything. They can't participate in meetings. They also cannot participate in IPC activities such as competitions. Russia and Belarus can appeal this decision, but if that doesn't go through, then the next time they can be have their membership reactivated is through a vote of the General Assembly, which won't happen until the final quarter of 2023. And the big consequence of this is that none of the athletes could participate in any of the qualifiers for Paris 2024. So basically, by definition, even if Russia and Belarus has been re- have been reinstated, by the time Paris comes around, if they've qualified no quotas, if they've qualified no athletes, too bad. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. And I, despite what I may have just sounded like, I do not feel bad for them at all. Even, you know what, I do, I of course feel bad for the athletes. I feel bad for any athlete that has, is kept from competing when they are trying. But how many times, how many times and how is starting a war, not enough. Can we just turn our heads to what Russia has done? Right. Well, we can only hope that this is a little bit of solace for Ukraine to see that there is international condemnation on a very, very high level for what's gone on. That's going to do it for this week. Let us know what your favorite moments and souvenirs are from Atlanta 1996. You can get in touch with us by email at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Our social handle is at flamealivepod. And be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook, where this week we are voting for Shook Flaston's official animal. This is a surprising vote so far. So I'm very curious to see how it goes. I'm excited to have an official animal, to be quite honest. So can't wait to see what you all choose. Next week, we will get an update on the L.A. Summer Olympics from Izzy Cerullo, two-time Olympian in Rugby Sevens, who is now an associate in Commercial and Consumer Insights for L.A. 2028. That is a good conversation that we are looking forward to sharing with you. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.